welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Luke Cobray. Father God, we just come before you today, Lord, and we're just grateful for the opportunity that we get to come into the house of the Lord. Father, we don't come into this place to hear from a man or to hear from a woman or to hear from a band. God, we don't come into this place to be entertained. But Lord, we come into this place to hear from you. And we fully acknowledge that Jesus Christ is the senior leader of this church. And so, Father, in the name of Jesus, we ask that your Holy Spirit would speak to us today, to minister to us, to show us the word that you would have us to hear today, Father, to open our eyes to see and the ears to hear. God, I thank you that the message today would be a seed that would be sown and planted into good ground in our hearts, Father, that we would leave this place, God, and bear much fruit from it. I thank you for the privilege and the the, the honor that we get to come into the house of the Lord. And, Father, we don't ask... We don't see ourselves as better than anybody else, but as co laborers So, Father, we ask that the same blessing that we pray upon ourselves, that you would impart to our brothers and sisters all across the Inland Empire and all around the world, that are preaching and teaching the wonderful gospel of Jesus Christ. Father, we lift up our Catholic brothers and sisters, our Presbyterian brothers and sisters, our Lutherans, and Methodists, and Episcopalian brothers and sisters, our Baptist brothers and sisters. Father, I thank you for Ecclesia Christian Center, Father, for Emmanuel Baptist, for Crossroads, Father. I thank you for Harvest Christian Fellowship, for Sandals, Lord, for all the churches all across the Inland Empire and all around the world, God, that are delivering your message. Lord, we don't see ourselves as better than anybody, but truly as brothers and sisters in Christ and as co-laborers in the body of Christ, all working to serve in your kingdom. And we give you the praise, Father, we give you the glory and give you the honor. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. amen. Well, hey, as you're being seated... Turn, in, turn with me to, in your word to the book of Hebrews as we continue our study in Hebrews, the fourth chapter. Coming to the conclusion of Hebrews, the fourth chapter. I'll tell you, it's amazing. And I'll tell you, I'm excited. Pastor Jim, when we came into Hebrews, the fourth chapter, Pastor Jim told us that Hebrews was a, chapter four was an amazing, power-packed chapter. But I'll tell you what, I, I'm excited for where we're at because this tail end of the Hebrews, the fourth chapter, and the verses that we're going to be exploring today and potentially for the next few weeks, I, I truly believe are like the, the grand finale to the fireworks show. I think that it's amazing what we've read already, but it's amazing to see where God's taking us and coming up, and I'm excited for what ha- God has for us. And so we've been continuing our study of line upon line, precept upon precept. That's the way the Bible was written. That's how we study it here on the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. And so here we are in Hebrews, the fourth chapter. We're going to go to verse number 16 today. But in order for us to fully understand verse number 16, we've got to understand verse number 15. So here we pick up in Hebrews, the fourth chapter, 15th verse, we read this. For we do not have a high priest. Now, if you haven't already circled that, underlined that, highlighted that, mark that in your Bible. Underline that word high priest. Because we're talking about Jesus Christ today. Our high priest, our representative, the the middleman between man and God. And I want to emphasize that today because of, we're going to talk about that. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Verse number 16 starts off with this, let us therefore. You see, I couldn't start us in verse number 16 without picking back up in verse number 15, because therefore we've been taught time and time again that whenever you see the word therefore, In the Bible, it's there for a reason. And I had you highlight, I had you underline or mark next to your Bible that word high priest because we have a high priest who doesn't just, who's not able to sympathize, but rather who has lived life as us, but who has passed through the heavens in the the previous verse, who has been tempted as we are, but was without sin. That's going to be important in a moment. So the Bible says, because of what I just said, Because of what was just said, let us therefore, verse number 16, come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Don't you know, aren't you grateful that you and I have the ability to obtain mercy and grace to help in time of need? I don't know about you, but there are times in my life where I need mercy. And we as People, we as humans oftentimes don't have that mercy bone in our body. We don't have that natural tendency to to give mercy, to, to, to have compassion like we've been talking about. But thank God we can go to the throne of God before the throne of God, the Bible says, boldly to obtain, to grab a hold of mercy and to find grace. Don't you know, you and I need the grace of God. 
God's sovereign divine ability to get the job done on our behalf when we can't do it. And I don't know about you, but there have been things in my life where I have tried, I have tried, and I have tried. And I have failed, and I have failed, and I have failed. And it was only until the grace of God, His sovereign divine ability to step in when I couldn't do it, well, that I was able to push through. And you and I, we need to know that we can go before the throne of God and obtain mercy, to obtain forgiveness, to obtain a cleansing from who we once were, and to find grace to take us to who God wants us to be. Amen? But in order for us to fully understand that first part of the 16th verse, I want to talk to you a little bit about the past. First, before we go into the past, let me say this. Some of the translations, more than some of the modern translations of, of Hebrews, the fourth chapter and the 16th verse, will say the word come literally means to, to, to draw near to, to approach to. And the word boldly is translated in some of the modern translations with confidence. As a matter of fact, if you have a New International Version Bible or one of the more modern translation Bibles, your verse might actually read something more like, let us therefore approach with confidence the throne of grace. You see, you and I can go before the throne of God with confidence, knowing first and foremost that our God is a God of mercy, knowing that our God, like I talked about on Wednesday night, our God is a God who knows what we need and has our best interest in his mind. And we can go with confidence knowing that when we go before God, we can make our petitions known, the Bible tells us in Philippians, to God. We can approach the throne of God. But you see, you and I live in a time of redemption. We have been born, all, there's nobody in this room that was born before Jesus Christ came. There was nobody in this room that experienced life before Jesus Christ. We have all been born into a new time. Uh, the, the new covenant, the Bible tells us, the New Testament. But before Jesus Christ, there was an old covenant. There was a covenant that God had made. And, and I truly believe if you and I are to grab a hold of the weight, the, the idea of us being able to even access the throne of God, we have got to understand where we as people, where we as the children of God have come from so that we might truly understand and appreciate when the Bible tells us that we can approach the throne of God with confidence. Let me say it like this. When you know the value of something, you treat it accordingly. Go with me now, put your imagination caps on, and let me give you a little illustration of that to kind of clarify it. Let's say somebody comes to your house. They knock on your door, and they say to you, hey, listen, I want to give you something. I got, I got the keys to a car. I want to hand the keys to the car over to you. No strings attached. I don't want anything in return. This is a gift from me to you. Praise God. That's a gift. All right. They say, come on, let's go look in the driveway. So you walk out and look in your driveway, and there it is, the keys to the car that they want to give you. And you see a 1985 Toyota Corolla. <laughs> the paint is a camouflage white and gray because half the white is peeling off. The tires are bald, leaks oil on your driveway. When you turn it on, the fan belt squeaks, and it has that real high-pitched, annoying sound but it's free. Say, hey, praise God, it's a, it's a gift. Don't you know that when it rains, you're not going to wash that Toyota Corolla right afterwards? Likely you're not going to go have it hand detailed and waxed every week. You know, you're not going to take care of that Corolla. Why? Because the value of that Corolla is not very high. But let's take that same situation. Now that person comes to your door and they say the same thing. I've got a keys to the car. I want to give you no strings attached. It's just for you. And you walk out to the driveway, and there you see it. Uh, uh, uh. A brand new candy apple red Ferrari. Woo! With hand-stitched leather seats, 12-cylinder engine. I mean, you hear the purr. She purrs of that engine. Don't you know that if your garage is full from floor to ceiling of your junk, that you're going to find a place in your garage to clean all that stuff out so that you can park your Ferrari in the garage. You don't want to leave it outside when it rains, don't you know? 
You're going to come and wash all those water spots off of that candy apple red. And you're not just going to take a towel out of the linen closet that was dirty and that had some grease on it. No, 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 no. You're going to go to the high-end auto store and you're going to buy that microfiber or that soft leather chamois so that you can, you can, you know, massage the paint without denting it. Without You know that when somebody gets in, when the wife or the kids get in the car, you know there's no food in the car. You know that. You don't want air fresheners in the car. You want to smell the fresh leather. And you're going to take care of that car more so than you would take care of that Hoopty Corolla. Why? Because you know the value of it. You know that that car costs hundreds of thousands of dollars. You know that that was a precious gift. And it's the same thing with our relationship with God. When we read Hebrews, the fourth chapter, and the 16th verse, and we say that we can access the throne of God with confidence... We say amen, hallelujah. But when we truly count the cost of what it cost God for us to be able to go before him with boldness, with confidence, then when we go before the Lord in prayer, when we go through the Lord in our relationships with God, we truly have a value placed upon it. And no longer do we treat it like a hoopty Corolla, like it was our right, like we were born into it. But rather now we understand that there was a plan that God had put in place over thousands of years for us to be blessed enough to go before him. And that's why today I want to take you back so that we can understand our future with God. I'm going to take you to some of the traditions of the Old Testament. And I'm going to take you to what it was like to go to the presence of God before Jesus Christ came. I'm going to show you some things so that you and I can count the cost of what it took for us to be able to boldly go before the throne of grace. So if you've got your Bibles with me, with you, turn with them to the book of Hebrews. Now we're in the book of Hebrews. Great. Flip a couple pages over to the book of Hebrews in the ninth chapter. Now I'm going to take you back. And in order to take you back, I'm going to take you forward. Whoa, I totally just blew your mind. It's all right. You say, Pastor Luke, we're studying the book of Hebrews, and now we're going to be reading out of the book of Hebrews. And I, you know, I, I will say that I was in turmoil about this. I was going to take you back to all the individual scriptures in the Old Testament to show you what Deuteronomy says, to show you what, what Exodus says, to show you what Numbers says. But then the Lord showed to me, you know, we've been in Hebrews for several years, and we find ourselves now in the fourth chapter. Now I've asked you to turn to Hebrews in the ninth chapter, and I thought, man, they're going to remember this. And I thought, you know what? It will be several years before we get to this point. And, you know, when it's Pastor Jim or it's Pastor Dan or maybe it's Pastor Luke that brings this, these verses back to your remembrance, I'm certain that you will sit there and say, wow, I've never heard this message before. <laughs> that was a good word. Because time will have passed. So what we're going to do is we're going to go to Hebrews, the ninth chapter, which describes what happened in the Old Testament. You can find all of this in great detail in the book of Exodus, the book of Numbers, and the book of Deuteronomy. But today, we're going to look at the book of Hebrews. In Hebrews, the ninth chapter, I want to talk to you. The title of today's message is Boldness Before God. Because you and I have boldness before God. We can have confidence before God. And today, what I want to talk to you about is a statement. If you're taking notes, write this statement down. Why we can have boldness before God. And if you, if you want to emphasize, underline, can have, because it's a privilege for us to have that. So we're going to talk today, this morning, about why we can have boldness before God. Number one this morning, we turn to Hebrews, the ninth chapter. Number one this morning, I want to say this, is that what was once off limits is now open. You see, you and I have access to God. The Bible tells us in Hebrews, the fourth chapter, that we can go before the throne of grace and obtain mercy find grace to help us in time of need. But there was a time when access to God, when access to the throne of God was off limits to mankind. Was unattainable, couldn't get there, couldn't make it, couldn't see it, couldn't handle it. Man couldn't do it. And we've got to understand that God had it in his plan to show man that they could not handle it, but then there would be a time through our great high priest, Jesus Christ, that the access to God was open. The Bible tells us that the universe is God's throne and the earth is his footstool. You see, we can't simply just go before God. We live in a time of oval offices and congresses, not necessarily thrones and scepters and, and nobility. But it's the same principle of access. At any given time, you and I cannot 
walk into the White House, walk up to the Oval Office and knock on Barack Obama's door and sit on the couch where his chief of staff sit when he has his meetings and speak to him face to face. Why? Because there's not access available. And it was much like that even more so to, from man to God before our high priest Jesus Christ came. And in Hebrews, the ninth chapter, we're going to start in Hebrews, the ninth chapter, in verse number six, we're going to pick up in verse number six. Verse number six starts off with, now when these things had been prepared, what are these things? Well, verse number one through five in Hebrews, the ninth chapter, outlines in, in, in briefness the traditions, the ceremonies, the tabernacle. The tabernacle literally means tent. The tent where the presence of God dwelt at the time. You see, God established a priesthood. God established a place for him to dwell while the children of Israel were on their way in the desert. They called it a tabernacle. Wherever they went, when they would move, they would pack up and then they would set up again. And the tabernacle was the, 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 the temple before it was ever built. And if you can just imagine quickly, I want to try to lay this out to you as simple as I can. Imagine this, a rectangle. Pretty simple. That rectangle represents the tabernacle. And inside that rectangle is a smaller rectangle. And that represents the holy place. And the, the, there was a courtyard where they had an altar where they would, burn their, 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 they would burn their sacrifices to God. And then inside the tabernacle, inside that big courtyard, was a smaller rectangle called the holy place. And in that rectangle, it was cut in half. There was a front entrance, and then there was a room through that front entrance called the holy of holies, or the most holy place. The front room was called the holy place. The back room was called the most holy place. And the back room was where the Ark of the Covenant was held, where God's covenant, his, his commitment to his people was kept. And that was the place that represented the dwelling place of God while the, while the children of Israel were wandering through the deserts. And finally, after David had come and gone and his son Solomon had built the temple, the temple, the holy place was in the temple established. And so it says in verse number 6, Now when these things had been thus prepared, the priests, the high priests, always went into the first part of the tabernacle. That first room, that entrance room, you could call that the foyer room, the holy place. It says they always went into the first part of the tabernacle performing the services. See, every day they went in there in the morning and they lit incense to, to God. And they had a lamp that was burning and they would trim the wicks of the lamp to keep it burning. And every night they would go back in there and they would burn more incense to God and they would trim the lamp to keep it going. Every day they did that. That was the ritual. And then once a week they would go in there and they had, they had on a table bread called the show bread. And the bread was a representation of God's, uh, God's manna, the, 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 the sustenance that God delivered to the people in the wilderness as they were adventuring to the promised land. So they had the show bread and every week they would go in and they would change the show bread as an offering to God. So they had a ritual every week they would go into that first room. But watch this. Verse number 7 says this, But into the second part, the high priest went alone once a year, not without blood, which he offered for himself in the people's sins committed in ignorance. You see, the priests could go into the entrance of the, the, the holy place and they could light the incense and they could trim the lamp. But only once a year, was the high priest the one man that God had chose to represent him to the people and the people to him. One representative chosen by God only one day a year on the day of atonement was that man allowed to enter the second room of the tabernacle, the room that housed the presence of God. And he was only allowed to go in one day a year and he was only allowed to go in with blood, with a sacrifice to God to cover the sins of the people and the sins of himself. So you see, it was outlawed for men to go in there. If you went in there unworthy, if you went in there in sin, if you were not the high priest or the call of God and you walked into that room, you did not come out. The presence of God was off limits. As a matter of fact, even before the priesthood had been established, as Moses was taking the children of Israel to the promised land, God had ascended upon Mount Sinai in a great cloud. And God had called Moses up there and Moses spent time in the presence of God. And God told Moses, you shall not come up on the mountain or have anybody even touch its base, lest you die. You see, it was an invitation only thing, and only one man, and one day a year, was allowed to enter into the presence of God. And he wasn't allowed to go in to make his petitions known, he was to go in for sacrifice, to 
to repent of the sins that they had committed for the previous year. And this is what it says in verse number 8. It says, And the Holy Spirit indicating this, that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was still standing. The Holy Spirit is speaking to you and I, showing us this, that the way into the holiest of all, the way into the presence of God, had not yet existed in that time while the first tabernacle existed, while the first tent, while the first dwelling place of God existed. It wasn't until Jesus Christ came and died upon that cross, like we had read in Hebrews, that he became our high priest, our representative between us and God and to God to us. It was only until that time that the access of God God was open to mankind. It was closed before that. And so we've got to understand that at one point, access to God was off limits. But now, we are open to it. Before Jesus Christ's redemption, the high priest could only go for sacrifice. Before the time of Moses, before the time of the priests, Moses was only allowed himself to go to the mountain. But now, through Jesus Christ, our great high priest, we have access. Now, because Jesus Christ came, we have access to the throne of God. You know, as a matter of fact, the Bible tells us that Jesus Christ is the spotless lamb. The, the high priest was only allowed to go into the holiest of holies with blood. And when Jesus Christ, the Bible tells us, our spotless lamb surrendered himself upon that cross. And he said those words that you can read in your Bible. He says, Father, into your hands I commit my soul. And he surrendered himself unto death. The Bible tells us that when he died, the earth shook. And when the earth shook, the temple at the time that housed the Holy of Holies was covered by a veil. And when Jesus died and the earth shook, that veil that housed that place of God, the dwelling place of God that only one man, one day a year was allowed to enter, that veil was ripped. But listen to this, that veil was ripped from top to bottom, not bottom to top. Why? Because that veil was ripped from God in heaven down to earth and now exposed the Holy of Holies, the, the, the presence of God to each and every one of us. And now in our day and age, now because of our high priest, Jesus Christ, who came before us, you and I have access to the throne of God. You see, the priests in the old times would go in to the Holy of Holies and they would go in fear and trembling because if they had sinned, because if they had not executed exactly to the T what God had told them to do, if they had not worn the garments exactly how God had told them to wear, they would not come out alive. As a matter of fact, Aaron, the very first high priest, his sons offered a sacrifice to God that was not what God had asked for, and they dropped dead. Right off the bat. It was a serious matter, but now the Bible tells us that when the priests would go into the holiest of all, they went in fear to offer sacrifice, but now you and I, children of God, we can go into the presence of God through the Holy Spirit with confidence, not with fear, knowing that our God is a God of mercy, knowing that our God is a God of grace to help us in our time of need. So we've got to understand, in order for us to fully have a mature understanding of accessing the throne of God with confidence, we've got to understand that there was a time when it was off limits to us. I won't have you turn there, I'll just put it up on the overhead. The Bible says in Ephesians, the second chapter, for through him, verse number 18 it says, for through him, capital H, speaking of Jesus Christ, we both, Paul is writing and he says, you and I both have access by one spirit to the Father. You and I now have the ability, you and I now have the access to go before God in the presence of God by the Spirit of God and make our petitions known as it says in Philippians. It is now open to you and I what was once closed. We're talking this morning about why we can have boldness before God. Number two this morning, what was once unattainable is now attainable. What you once could not have, you now can have. And I'm speaking to salvation through grace. You see, the priest, when they would go into the presence of God, they had to bring sacrifice. And they sacrificed for their own sins, and they sacrificed for the sins of the people. And let me tell you a little bit about the tradition. Let me tell you about a little bit about the ritual, what God had laid out for them. They were to sacrifice a bull on the Day of Atonement, and they were to take two goats. One goat was a sacrifice. The second goat is what we call a scapegoat that was 
that remained alive. And this goat represented the sins of the people. And so they would sacrifice the goat for the people. And the second goat, they would uh, ritualistically, or they would, uh, 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 you know, they would, as a, as, a, as a sign, they would place their sins. It would be a representation of their sins for that year. And they would take that goat, and they would drive that goat out into the wilderness, away from the camp, away from the cities, out into the sticks where nobody else went. And that goat stayed there. They didn't kill it. They left it alive. You see... The meaning behind that is, is God knew what he was doing. God knew what he was doing when he set this covenant, when he set these laws. He wanted to show men that the law, that the, the covenant that he had made with them was an imperfect one to show them that they could not attain salvation on their own through rules and regulations. And so they would take this goat and they would send it out to the, to the outermost of the camp and they would send it out into the wilderness. The representation here is this. That your sins never went away. You see, that goat represented your sins. Could you imagine the implications if that goat somehow found its way back into camp? And here you are sitting, eating your dinner, and the goat that represents your sins walks right across your house. You see, what that means is that your sins had not yet been washed away, but rather had been pushed away, swept under the carpet. That the wrath of God had been, had, been, uh, had, had been satisfied, but you had not been yet redeemed. And what was once unattainable to you and I, salvation, through our high priest, Jesus Christ, was now attainable to us. And no longer are our sins swept under the carpet. No longer do we have a scapegoat that we send out into the wilderness with the slight chance that it might find its way back. Now the Bible tells us that you and I are new creations. Now the Bible tells us that the old has not just been pushed away, but has now passed away. And we are new in Christ. So what was once unattainable is now attainable. We can now have in Hebrews, the ninth chapter, moving on. Hebrews, the ninth chapter, verse number nine, it says this. It says, it was symbolic for the present time. The present time, speaking of when they were doing this, it was symbolic in the Old Testament in which both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot, listen to this, which cannot make him who performed the service perfect in regard to conscience, concerned only with foods and drinks, various washings and fleshly ordinances imposed until the time of reformation, until the time that Jesus Christ came and died on the cross and the new covenant, the new testament was birthed, Looking back to verse number 9, it says this, it says, Which cannot make him who performed the service perfect in regard to the conscience. You see, the sacrifice that the priest entered or offered as he went into the Holy of Holies covered the sin of mankind, but it did not cover the sin nature of mankind. You see, the sacrifice did not redeem the person, it redeemed the acts. And it wasn't until Jesus Christ laid himself on that cross, surrendered himself to the cross, and committed himself as a sacrifice, the spotless lamb, it wasn't until then that our sins have been now washed away. We can now be made perfect by following after him who came before us who was perfect. Not just a man, but God himself, Jesus Christ, came, lived a life, the Bible tells us. It was tempted in all points as we are, yet without sin. The Bible tells us he had passed through the heavens, is now seated at the throne of God. You see, no longer does sacrifice, is sacrifice required on our parts. No longer do you and I have to sacrifice to make atonement, to make forgiveness for our sins, but now you and I are free of forgiveness. No longer does sacrifice, listen to this, no longer does sacrifice, no longer do we buy God's restraint through sacrifice, Jesus Christ bought our redemption through his blood. No longer are our sins swept under the carpet. They have been blotted out by the blood of Jesus Christ. What was once unattainable is now attainable. Keep your thumb or keep your finger in Hebrews, the ninth chapter, and go with me quickly to Romans in the third chapter. Romans in the third chapter. Are you guys still with me this morning? I know it's a lot, but I know that when you grab a hold of this, when you let this drop into your spirit, I tell you, it will change your life. In approaching the throne of God. Romans in the third chapter. 
Romans in the third chapter, verse number 23, Romans 3, 23 says this, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. It doesn't matter who you are, it doesn't matter how good you've been, you have a sin nature in you that you cannot escape. And the Bible says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Verse number 24, speaking of our time now, it says we have been justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is Jesus Christ. You see, Jesus Christ is now our high priest. He is our sacrifice that has bought our, our sins and paid the price for us so now we don't have to. Verse number 25 says, Whom God set forth as a propitiation, as a placement for your sin, by His blood through faith, to demonstrate his righteousness, because in his forbearance, in his tolerance, God has passed over the sins that were previously committed. To demonstrate at the present time, there's that word present time, but now we're speaking of this time now. To demonstrate right now that his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus Christ. You see, the Old Testament, the covenant that God made between man and himself was imperfect. And it showed the law, the purpose of the law, the purpose of that covenant was to show man that they could not get to God on their own. And when man realized that they could not get to God on their own, that they could not attain perfection, like it said in Hebrews, the ninth chapter, then he would come and deliver them with perfection through Jesus Christ. And now you and I live in a perfect time. Now you and I live in a time where we can attain grace, we can attain salvation, not through sacrifice, not through blood, but now through the grace of God, through Jesus Christ, the sacrifice that was poured upon us on that cross on Calvary. So you see, we have access to the throne of God. We can go boldly before the throne of God. Why? Because the price was paid for us. There was a time when we weren't able to. There was a time when sins were swept under the carpet rather than blotted out. But now you and I are blessed enough to live in a time now, church, are you hearing me? We are blessed enough now to live where our sins are not swept under the carpet, but now we are blotted out and we are now, what the Bible tells us, a new creation. No longer are we who we once were. Now we can attain perfection through Jesus Christ. And we're talking about why we can have boldness before God. Number three today. Final thought for this morning. Why we can have boldness before God. Number three is what was once flawed is now perfect. What was once flawed is now perfect. You see, the high priest represented God to men and he represented man to God. 364 days a year, the high priest had a priestly garment. It was draped in gold and fine, fine colors. He looked much like a king. Because he represented God to the people. But on the day of atonement, when he went before God, he was to shed those garments and put on a white linen to represent the, the attire of a slave, the people, to God and to make sacrifice for their sins. And they were flawed. It was a flawed system having a man represent other men. You and I live in a time when we have presidents, we have senators, we have congressmen. We understand that it's a flawed system in the sense that when you have somebody else representing your best interests, they don't always look out for your best interests. And the priests were men. They had to offer sacrifice for themselves. So it was a flawed system to have a man who had a sinful nature himself to represent you who had sinful natures yourselves. But now all of a sudden God says, I'm going to take what was flawed and I'm going to finalize it and I'm going to turn the coin over to the other side. And now you and I have a high priest. The high priest being the representative of us to God and God to us. Our high priest is Jesus Christ. Not just a man, a perfect man. God himself who came, breathed the air that we breathe, tempted in all points as we are, who lived a life that was not in sin. And guess what? He was not bound by death. Not limited in his, in his time of being our high priest. Now for eternity, we have our representative before God, Jesus Christ. Let me show you. You had your finger there in Hebrews, the ninth chapter. Let's go back there to Hebrews in the ninth chapter. As we conclude this morning. Hebrews in the ninth chapter, verse number 11. It says this, but Christ came as high priest 
of the good things to come with a greater and more perfect tabernacle. The tabernacle, remember, being the tent or the dwelling place that God was with a more greater dwelling place of God. Not made with the hands, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation. Men did not make this one. Not with the blood of, cal- of goats and of calves, but with his own blood he entered the most holy place. Once and for all, having obtained eternal redemption. You see, the high priest was allowed to go once a year, one day. Once a year, one day. And the Bible tells us now our high priest, Jesus Christ, came. And he came with his own blood that he entered the most holy place once and for all. The high priest was only allowed to go in and come out. But you and I have a representative, Jesus Christ, who came in. And guess what? He did not come out. He went, and the Bible tells us now that he is seated at the throne of God. The Bible tells us that he makes intercession for us. What does that mean? The Bible tells us that he is our mediator. He is on our side. He is there saying, hey, God, forgive them of their sins because I paid for it. Forgive them of their past because I paid for it. They are no longer who they are because I paid for it. And now what was once flawed, now we have a perfect representative before God, Jesus Christ, our great high priest. And we are blessed. We have been given, church, such a blessing that we live in a day and age that we have today. That we have the blessings and the honor to accept Jesus Christ as our great high priest. To accept him as our Lord and Savior so that now you and I, when we read Hebrews the fourth chapter in the 16th verse, and it tells us that you and I can go uh, boldly before the throne of God to know this. That you and I have the access to God. That it is not closed off anymore because what was once off limits is now open. You see, what was once unattainable through Jesus Christ, our great high priest, is now attainable. You see, what was once flawed is now perfect. And you and I can go before the throne of God. So let's look back. Hebrews in the fourth chapter. Hebrews in the fourth chapter. Verse number 14. Hebrews 4.14, seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we don't have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness. We do not have, church, a mediator, a representative to God who is holier than thou, who is better than thou, who cannot understand what you and I have lived through, who didn't experience the pain that we lived through, didn't experience the temptation that we lived through, but rather now we have God himself who came in the form of man, Jesus Christ, who experienced pain, who experienced heartache, who experienced disappointment, who experienced temptation, but yet came through the other side. So now when he represents us to God as our high priest, he understands what we've been through. But was at all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Verse number 16, let us therefore come boldly. Let us therefore come to. Let us therefore approach with confidence the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. You see, you have not been given a hoopty because you have been born into a time of redemption does not mean that your gift is not valued but rather to understand that you have access to the throne of God, but it, was a, it came at a high price. It came at the price of mankind. It came at the price of Jesus Christ. So now that you and I can live a life understanding that we have the keys to something more valuable, keys to something priceless. A Ferrari doesn't even come close to what you and I have the access to now, the throne of God himself. And we have to, in conclusion, one last thought, church. We cannot mistake the word boldness. We cannot mistake the word confidence with arrogance or conceit. We oftentimes in America, because of our civil rights, because of our freedom of speech, mistake the word boldness with the ability to speak whatever we want. I'm going to tell you what I think. I'm going to speak my mind. But the bottom line is is that you and I have got to understand that we've been given a gift. 
we've been given something that came at a high price. And boldness and confidence mean this, that you and I can go before God knowing that we will not get judgment when we go before God. If we go before him and the Bible tells us that if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just. No longer is he somebody that we have to buy his, his, buy his time. But now we have redemption and been made clean. And now we can go before the throne with confidence knowing that God is a God of mercy and of grace. God is a God who has our best interests in his mind. And with that in mind, we go before the throne in humility and humbleness, saying, God, you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And I'm just grateful for the opportunity that I have because of the price that was paid, that I have the ability to come to the throne, that I might find mercy and that I might find grace. Did you guys get something out of the word of the Lord this morning? I want to ask you a question, a very important question. And I want you to examine yourself and examine your answer. If you were to leave this place today, heaven forbid this be the case, but if you were to leave this place today and your heart were to just stop beating and you were to just die, I hope that's not the case, I pray it so. But if you were to die, would you find yourself in heaven or would you find yourself in hell? You know, the Bible says that a man ought to examine himself from time to time, so why don't we go over some of those answers? You know, nobody would know that answer except you and God, not the person next to you, behind you, in front of you, your husband, your wife. Nobody knows that answer except you and God. Hey, did you know that you can't get to heaven because you think you're going to get there? Because you want to go? Because you hope that you're going to get to heaven? Nowhere in the Word of God does it say that you're going to get to heaven because you think so, because you hope so, because you want to, like you have the most positive outlook on life. Do you know you can't get to heaven because you're a good person? Because you don't cheat on your taxes? Because you've never robbed the 7-Eleven? You know, as a matter of fact, the Bible tells us that our good deeds, according to God, are like filthy rags. Nothing you and I could ever do on our own would ever make us good enough to get into heaven. Yet so many people in America believe that all they have to do is simply be a good person to get into heaven. Hey, did you know that you can't get to heaven because your parents told you you were a Christian as a kid? Because you went to Sunday school or Sabbath school or catechism classes? Because you were baptized or christened as a baby? Nowhere in the Word of God does it say that because somebody blew smoke and water over you. Nowhere in the Bible does it say because you attended class. Nowhere in the Bible do you read that because you sit in church that you're going to get your way into heaven. There's more to, get, more to it than that to get into heaven. You know, the bottom line is this. You can't get into heaven by classification because you weren't raised as a Buddhist, as a Hindu, or as a Muslim. Nowhere in the Word of God do you find that that puts you by default as a Christian in getting into heaven. The bottom line is this, church. You can't get to heaven your way. You can't get to heaven my way. You can't get to heaven some well-meaning church committee's way. The only way to get to heaven is through Jesus Christ, God's way. Jesus Christ said that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And no man goes to the Father except through him. So, you know, we can't get there your way. We can't get there my way. Nothing you and I could ever do on the outside makes us good enough to get into heaven. Let me show it to you in the Word of God. In the book of John, third chapter, a man by the name of Nicodemus comes to Jesus and he asks Jesus, what must I do to get into heaven? Now Nicodemus, the Bible tells us, was a Pharisee, a leader of the Jews. What that means is that Nicodemus had dedicated his life to studying the scripture, to memorizing the word of God. Nicodemus was allowed to preach in the temple. Nicodemus wore all the right clothes, did all the right things. And when Nicodemus comes to Jesus and he asks Jesus that question, you would think that Jesus would pat him on the back and say, Nicodemus, man, you just keep on going. Great is your reward in heaven. But you see, Jesus looks at Nicodemus and he says to him, you must be born again. Well, what does that mean, born again? You've heard that term, Hollywood, popular culture, society. You know, they've made a mockery out of that. You think radical, crazy, out of control, weirdo Christianity. But let me tell you something. From the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, born again has always meant the same thing. It means that you've given God all of your heart and you've given God all of your life. You see, with God, it's an all or nothing relationship with Him. He wants all of your heart. He wants all of your life. It's not about your mental ascent towards Him. It's not about your memorization of Bible verses, but rather all of your heart, all of your life. Let me show it to you. In the book of Revelation, Jesus Christ is speaking to the church and he says to them, when I come back, I better find you hot or I better find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. Quote, bold statement designed to get your attention. And what he's saying is, listen, I better find you in or I better find you out because if I find you lukewarm in the middle somewhere, I will vomit you out, cast you out, reject you 
out of the kingdom of God. It's an all or nothing relationship. It's not about how many memory verses you can remember. It's not about how many times you sit in church. It's not about wearing the right clothes. It's about all of your heart, all of your life to Jesus Christ. Well, what does lukewarm mean? Let me define that for you in terms of your relationship with God. Lukewarm means that you're a little bit up, you're a little bit down, a little bit in, a little bit out. You're kind of floating around in your relationship with God. You're riding the fence. You know, you're not wholehearted for God, but you're not wholehearted against Him kind of doing your own thing, kind of doing a little bit of God's thing. You're right there in the middle. And Jesus Christ says, hey, listen, if that's you living lukewarm, doing your own thing instead of God's thing today, you are deceived in thinking that you're going to get into heaven. Well, then what do we do? Jesus Christ said that if you confess him before men, he'll confess you before his father. But if you deny him, he will deny you before his father. So here's what I'm going to do in a moment. I'm going to count to three. I'm going to go one, two, three. Three, I'm going to smack my hand on my Bible, make a loud noise, just like that. And if you've never given your heart, you've never given your life to Jesus Christ in a moment, I want you to pop your hand up and give him your heart, give him your life. What you're doing by putting your hand up is you're saying this. You're saying, I want to give Jesus Christ. I acknowledge that I want to surrender my heart. I want to give him all of my life today. I'll see it. You can put it right back down. You say, Pastor Luke, if I put my hand up, I'm going to be embarrassed. You know what? Here's the bottom line. You might be embarrassed because somebody might see you. But I'm not going to embarrass you. And even if you were embarrassed, wouldn't it be better to spend a moment of, etern- of embarrassment than an eternity in hell because you couldn't profess Jesus in a welcome and loving place like the church? You see, today is the day of your salvation. Don't let it pass you by. So who should raise their hand? If you've never given them all of your heart, if you've never given them all of your life, in a moment, when I count to three, get your hand up. I'll see it. You can put it right back down. Who should raise their hand? If you're not sure today, let's make today the day you make sure. Don't walk out of this place without making sure. If you've never given a public profession of your faith, you've never publicly announced that you've given Jesus Christ all of your heart today, put your hand up so I can see it. Put it right back down. Who should raise their hand finally? If you've been living lukewarm, doing your own thing instead of God, saying running from God instead of to God, today it's the day. Listen, stop playing games with God. And let's make today the day you go forward for him and get hot and make sure that you get yourself into heaven. All across this auditorium, all at the same time, hands are getting ready to go up. If that's you in a moment, I'm going to count to three. If you've never given them all your heart, you've never given them all your life, come on, in a moment, that's you. If you're not sure, make sure don't leave this place today without making sure. That's a gamble on your eternal life you can't afford to make. I am certain that each and every one of you can relate to somebody or know somebody whose life was taken from them in an instant that they didn't know about. You don't know what's going to happen outside of these doors. Don't leave this place without making sure. And finally, if you've been living lukewarm, running from God instead of to God, you've been riding that fence. Today, let's make it the day you go hot for God and get yourself into heaven. All across the auditorium, all at the same time, hands are getting ready to go up. If that's you, on the count of three, get your hand up. Here we go. One, two, three. Let me see your hands in the house today. Okay, I got you. One. I see a hand. I saw a hand. Two, three. I got you guys. Get your hands up so I can see them. Four, five, six. Seven, eight. Get your hands up. If you got your hand up so I can see it. Nine, ten. Ten wise people. Anybody else in the house? Eleven. Okay, I got you back there in the back. Eleven wise people. Where are you at in the house today? You say, man, I wonder if I should. Twelve. I see you in the family rooms. Over here in the family rooms. Is there anybody over there? That's you. Get your hand up so I can see it. Twelve wise people. You say, man, I wonder if I should. I wonder if I should. Today is the day. Stop playing games with God. Quit messing around. Get your hand up today and let's go forward for God. If that's you in the place today, get your hand up so I can see it. Anybody else? 12, 13 wise people. I didn't embarrass them. I won't embarrass you. 14, I got you, sister. 14 wise people. Anybody else today? You say, man, I wish this guy'd shut up. I want to get out of here. Get your hand up. Let's go forward for God today. Anybody else in the house today? Anybody else? 14 wise people. Well, praise God for 14 wise people. Hallelujah. Here's what I want to do. For the 14 or so of you who raised your hand, for the six others of you that didn't raise your hand, it's not too late. In a moment, I'm going to ask everybody to stand up. If you raised your hand or you should have raised your hand, I need you to be bold. You said you were going to give Jesus Christ all of your heart. You said you wanted to give him all of your life. So I want you to be bold. I want you to grab your coat, your sweater, your Bible, your friend, a purse. If you need whatever you need, whatever you came with, grab it. Get out of your seat when everybody stands up and come and meet me. You said you wanted to give him all of your heart. You said you wanted to give him all of your life. Let us help you and pray with you today. If that's you, let's all stand together. If you raise your hands from the family rooms, from the back, wherever you're at, get out of your seat. Get out of your chair and come up here today. Come on, if that's you, come on. 
Come on. Hey, listen, guys. Today is the first day of the rest of your lives. Today is a new day. Here's what I want to do. I want to introduce a friend of mine to you. This is Pastor Dave. See him right over here? Pastor Dave is like the nicest guy. I'll tell you what. There is nobody nicer than Pastor Dave. And what he's going to do, he's going to take you right over there. Nothing weird goes on. He's going to lead you in a prayer. You don't get saved by raising your hand. You get saved by asking Jesus Christ to come into your heart and come into your life. So he's going to lead you in a prayer. He's going to give you some free things, free things. A book that our senior pastor wrote called Welcome to Your Destiny. Very small, very simple to read. It says, hey, I got saved. Now what do I do? He's going to invite you into a program that we have at the church called Spiritual Personal Trainers. When you go to the gym, you see a personal trainer, somebody helps you build, build those muscles and helps you lift those weights and make sure you're eating the right foods to get strong. We have Spiritual Personal Trainers, a friend, somebody that will meet with you right before service for 15 minutes. I'll get you a cup of coffee right over there in our cafe and teach you for five weeks, very short, very simple, some things about God to get you strong in the ways of God so you don't go back to the junk that you came from. And I want to ask one more. I know it's a lot. I want to ask one more thing of you. I want to ask, if you're serious about this today, that you commit 12 months to sitting under the Word of God here at church, to listen, to get the Word of God into your heart. And I promise you, if you do, I promise you, if you do, I guarantee it, if you do, you'll look back on this day, 365 days from now, and you will look back and say, wow, I can't believe what God has done in my life and how different of a person I am, if you listen and get the Word of God into your spirit. So if you guys would just go right over there with Pastor Dave, he's going to pray with you.